Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. What's new and exciting in your world this weekend? Well, we're lucky that we're recording this because it's taken us about 36 hours to get this bit of the recording done between Zoom not working, your headphones not working, my earbuds not working, our task cam's not working, and believe it or not, our phone's not working. And don't forget the Comcast technology that sits below every episode. Libsyn, our podcast host, was offline for a few hours on Monday. Yeah, so in short, it's been a royal pain getting this episode up and running. Right. The next solution was for the two of us to come to each one of your houses and just do this in person. <laughs> that would have been expensive, to say the least. And, you know, we already lose enough money doing this every week as it is. It's pretty much the only option left. This week, I want to talk about the price of gas. Price of gas is down about 12% from where it was this time last month. So to the price of oil which is excellent news. I mean, it's still above $4 a gallon, but at least it's not pushing 5 This caused me to go back and pull historical data on the price of gas and adjust it for inflation so that we're talking about dollars as we think of them today. An interesting thing emerges. For pretty much all of the 1990s, the price of gas in the United States averaged about $2.30 a gallon, you know, plus or minus a bit. But it was that for a decade. That's $2.30 in today's terms. Then it runs up from 2000, roughly 2003, to the housing bust at 2008, and it hits a height of $5.60, so actually higher than what we hit at our peak here recently. $5.60 in today's dollars. And then, and here's where life becomes really interesting, it drops. The, so this peak in 2008 was also in July, like we are now. The peak was in July of 2008 in five months the price of gas had dropped 60% from $5.60 down to $2 and a quarter. Then it came back up again, but generally speaking, it leveled out around $2.80 prior to COVID. We had our peak last month. If history repeats itself, come December, we might be looking at very cheap gas. Well, here's to hoping. Because this gets us to something that's really operating on my last nerve right now. One of the greatest victims of the spike in the cost of gas, in this case, diesel ice cream trucks. They're disappearing around the country. And all I can say to this is any problem in the ice cream market is a problem to be solved right now. (laughs) It's James' special interest. Most days, it's my only interest. I think about ice cream almost every minute of every day, and now I'm about to get less of it because of the price of diesel. Aren't there other groups of people we can pick on besides the ice cream vendors of the world? I was thinking about food vendors in general, but food vendors are different. The food trucks park at one place. The ice cream trucks constantly moving around. So I could see how the price of diesel is more important to him. When I was a boy, I remember that song the ice cream truck played as it came through the neighborhood. Right. I was never allowed to have ice cream. Too expensive, my mother said. And I did what every child does. I said, when I get older, I'm having ice cream for dinner every night. And while I don't do that, I would if it didn't attract too much attention. As it stands, I eat ice cream every night after everybody goes away. (laughs) Because I don't want to share it either. What's your favorite flavor? My favorite everything is blueberry, but you can almost never get blueberry ice cream. I made it once because they couldn't get anybody to make it for me. This brings us to the foolishness of the week. I want to talk about a guy, Lenny Bruce. Lenny Bruce was a comic, but he was really a social critic who was humorous. He said some things that really pissed everybody off. He was forever being escorted from places in handcuffs for obscenity. Hmm. When we think about Lenny Bruce now, we think about those backwards morons who would dare stifle his free speech. He was such a great critic that they should have been taking notes, not shutting him down. I think that's right. But I think that would be right no matter who it was. I don't think anybody should be punished for speech. Free speech should be our default all the time. But the thing is, people today say, well, if I were alive back then, I would have defended him. But lo and behold... Dave Chappelle goes out to give a show, some people complain on Twitter, and the venue shuts him down. Why? Because he said things they didn't like. What do you expect from a comedian? Come on. Well, here's an idea. Don't listen. Right. If you don't like it, 
don't go to the venue, which you probably weren't doing anyway. But it was important for these people that everybody else right. share their opinion. And the owner of the venue, sensing that if you let Dave Chappelle go on, maybe next week he wouldn't have any audience at all, canceled poor Chappelle. And I mean that. He is an absolute victim here. Now, they moved the show to someplace else, and all right, maybe it came off. But the issue is that a bunch of cranky old ladies of both genders and all ages got up in the business of a venue, got a man shut down from doing what he does for a living so that they could feel better. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, what's next? Are we going to shut down certain concerts because we don't like that kind of music? It's that rock and or roll. Let's just shut that down, too. Because if you can look at Lenny Bruce and say that was a mistake, but then look at Dave Chappelle and say, but he deserved it, you're the problem. This is the theme with busy bullies everywhere, that they can't seem to fathom that other people have different opinions, different preferences than they do. And if, if something is offensive to them, well, it must be offensive to everyone. So let's shut the thing down. Tagging on to your story, I have a interesting story about censoring in Twitter. I say story. It was my own experience. Somebody posted an interview with Noam Chomsky. Noam is saying that the U.S. government is censoring links to the Russian media. To demonstrate that this was clearly not the case, I commented on the Twitter feed, and my comment was a link to TASS, the major Russian newspaper. Would you believe that Twitter censored my link to TASS? <laughs> somehow that seems exactly right. Exactly right. Did they take it down or block it or just put a nasty comment? They put on the it? nasty comment. So if you click on the link, a thing pops up saying that this is Russian news and maybe you don't want to go look at it. Twitter for the win once again. Astounding. To get more Ant and James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. If you'd like to support Words and Numbers, make your way over to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers, where you can contribute to our podcast-making habits. If you'd like to schedule us to come speak at your event, be it corporate or educational, or have James officiate at your wedding, send us an email at wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. There's all kinds of things happening, and none of them seem all that noteworthy. Yeah, it's been a quiet week, oddly. There's not much going on in the world, which I think is generally for the best. Yeah, I can point to a couple of things that are not going on. One is we're not getting much news out of Ukraine, and I'm not sure if that's good or bad. because Yeah, it could go either way. Yeah, it could be that there's nothing interesting going on. It could be that there's something going on that people aren't going to like or the media doesn't like or whatever it is. And then I've been doing a lot of interviews about the economy, inflation, are we headed into recession, this sort of thing. And all of that is in stasis because we're waiting for the next, you know, these numbers don't come out instantaneously. You've got to wait for them to come out. And I think the next batch of serious numbers on economic growth come out in about 10 days time. Until they come out, there's not much for us to say about what's going on in the economy. Inflation is very clearly an issue. Right. And it's not going away anytime soon. We might be in for a protracted period of inflation. Look, I'm not a fan of Joe Biden. I tend not to be a fan of any politician. This isn't his fault. Yes. Half the world says, no, 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 Joe's perfect. The other half says, no, 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 Joe's never done a right thing in his entire life. But none of what we're looking at now is, strictly speaking, Joe's fault. No. You're right. So let me say two things here. The inflation you're seeing absolutely is not Joe's fault. But in addition, on the flip side, Elizabeth Warren was tweeting the other day that unemployment is down to whatever it's down to. And you can thank Joe Biden for those jobs. No, you can't nope. thank Joe Biden. That's thank not right. Either. Entrepreneurs, you thank consumers. Joe Biden happened to be sitting in the White House when it happened. But so, too, with inflation. The only thing presidents could do is get out of everybody's way. Right. And they do not do that. The only way they could have made the environment friendlier for the sorts of things they want to take credit for, they don't do. The next thing, though, Ant, people are thumping their feet and hands and saying, ah, recession. But none of them know what a recession actually is. It has a technical definition. Well, yeah, not it's well, OK. 
It does and doesn't have a technical definition. What I mean by that is the rule of thumb people tend to go by is two quarters of negative growth, but that's just a rule of thumb. There isn't a strict definition. Having said that, the National Bureau of Economic Research, NBER, is the organization that officially blesses the timeline and says, verily, this is or is not a recession. So it's kind of like whatever they say was recession, that's recession. That doesn't sound so great. Well, that's kind of the way it is. Because you think about it, there's lots of factors you want to look at. It's unemployment. It's also GDP growth. There's lots of things going on. You can't boil it down to one specific item. Well, if you said two or three quarters of negative growth, I'm on board. Mm. That seems about right. That smells right, roughly speaking. Yeah, three would be better, I think. Yeah, but we've got this weird situation going on now where real GDP growth, the, the last numbers that came in, the last numbers were for quarter one of 2022. So again, we're waiting for the next numbers. Quarter one, 2022 was a contraction. GDP growth was down. And you point to that and say, look, this is recessionary, except On the other hand, James, unemployment right now in the country is at the same level it was prior to COVID. So you got these conflicting things. That was a long walk home to get back to parity there. Yeah, you're right. 3.6% for people who are interested. Yep. And maybe this is one of those measurement problems, right? Because everywhere I go, I still see help wanted signs. Right. Yeah. So we might be on the ass end of one of these sorts of things where people drop out of the number and show no interest in getting employed again. Okay, I don't exactly know what to do with that, and this points to the problems with data. The data is out there, but how do you understand it? How do you classify it? And it's very difficult to do these things. It's not some nefarious thing that a bunch of bureaucrats do. It's a legitimate difficulty. It is, and this time around, it's even more difficult than usual because of the emergence of the gig economy. Right. Millions of Americans are obtaining their primary, not secondary, but primary source of income from the gig economy, doing whatever it is, DoorDash or Uber or Airbnb or whatever it is. Yep. Had this discussion with my Uber driver this very morning. Yeah. And here's the weird thing. When we quote unemployment figures, they come from, depending on who it is that's collecting them, surveys of businesses or payroll numbers. But none of this stuff accounts for people who are working in the gig economy. And so you get this weird situation where it's possible to have a bunch of people employed, i.e. gig workers, and yet those same people not showing up in employment statistics. As usual, we'll all have a better idea of what's happening today in six months. Oh, yeah. In six months, we'll be able to point back to today and say, oh, here's what's what's going on. Yeah, yeah. That's right. We do a hell of a job predicting the past. But I digress. But let's dwell on that thought for a moment because one of, it's only one of the problems that arises when you ask politicians to manage an economy is that the politicians are bound by the same problem that we're discussing. That at any given point in time, they only know what the economy looked like if they're lucky six months ago. Right. If they're not lucky, they know what looked like a year ago, but not what it looks like today. Would you want a bunch of politicians managing a laundromat? The answer is, of course you wouldn't. They show no aptitude towards managing anything. So when we give politicians credit for running an economy, that's stupid. They do no such thing. Conversely, when we blister them with criticism for ruining an economy, yeah, careful there too, because that's not how things work. They get in the way, they cause problems on the margins, but right down the center of Main Street, you will not find politicians for good or for ill. Yeah, on a day-to-day basis, I think you're right. Now, where their effects do show up are in broad brush strokes over decades. Yeah, that's right. So you talk about the national debt. That's the result of generations of politicians. The pernicious nature of the New Deal, this sort of thing that we still feel the effects of that even today. Yeah. These are obvious things that we can talk about. But trade with China in 1993, no, not so much. Anyway, I want to talk about something that's very interesting and maybe uplifting in its own way. Here we are, Ant, in the middle of July. And I came across this head. Well, I got to give credit where it's due. The wife sent this over to me and said, talk about this. When I said, we got nothing to talk about. Okay. 
U.S. sees its biggest online spending day of the year thanks to Amazon's Prime Day. Who saw that one coming? I remember the first time they did Prime Day, I was all excited because I like a good bargain. And I logged on when they told me to, and it was one stupid piece of garbage after another. There wasn't a single thing on Prime Day that I would have purchased. Now, I didn't participate in Prime Day. What happens here? They have a bunch of sales. They call it Prime Day. They sell everything for pennies on the dollar. It's sales. Okay. It's akin to what you would see on Cyber Monday, except apparently this is bigger than Cyber Monday. Huh. Here, right from the article, online sales surpassed $6 billion, up 7.8% from one year ago. What does that tell you about the economy? According to Adobe Digital Economy Index, which tracks online sales, and here's where it gets fascinating, the amount also surpassed last year's Thanksgiving Day spending. Oh, wow. That's impressive. How did that happen? We have already observed that the economy is in a rough patch. We are likely in what any reasonable person would call a recession. We're waiting on the official numbers to so declare it. But boy, it sure smells that way when I walk around. And yet people in the comfort of their own homes just spent more than $6 billion on trinkets and doodads and electronics from Amazon. So which is it? Are we in a recession or are people spending in this freewheeling sort of way? And come to find out, it seems to be both. It's interesting you say that, because as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, it sounds like there's almost two economies. Yes. The physical economy and the online economy. And one's doing well and the other one's not. I think it's more than that. I think in some respects, the world has caught up with my kind of thinking, that when you see a good deal, you take it, Mm -hmm. and you worry about exactly what you need later on. I tend to stock my entire house at 50% off. And I think what you see here is what my family would have called Italian grandmother syndrome, where you got all the money stuffed underneath the mattress and before the box spring. Mm -hmm. I think there's part of that going on here, right? That when money's tight and it's not exactly clear that people's jobs are safe, maybe it's time to be looking for a real value at the point of retail. I think that people know that times are going to be tough. And if you can get something you want, and the one that stuck out to me was the Amazon Fire Stick for your TV. It was down to $16. you imagine that? How about $16? that? Yeah. I kicked myself because I bought one a couple of months for 35 You and I talked about that thing when it first came out. Yeah. And I want to say it was years ago. And in my mind, it was like a couple hundred dollars or something, wasn't it? I think it was like a hundred. Yeah. And then they came out with the Cube sometime later, and that was better, but it cost the same. When you can get that kind of a discount, a lot of people are inclined to just take it. Yes, it's spending, but it's spending with an eye cast toward future downturns. Mm -hmm. We're saying things like, I might not be able to justify this expense in the future, and they're giving it to me at half off now. So I'll take it. If we're in a recession, we shouldn't be seeing this. If you're correcting your assessment, then what we should see is that come the fall and we hit Cyber Monday, for example, you should see the sales on Cyber Monday remarkably low. Maybe. In other words, all we've done is shifted our spending from then till now. That might be right. And I would just say, well, it's going to depend on the nature of the values offered. If you can get a TV for 60% off on Cyber Monday, well, I can tell you sales are going to be robust. Mm -hmm. But if they can't beat the prices that Amazon just offered, and you know they'll all be studying what Amazon just offered, there will be algorithms designed to figure out how low the pricing has to go to achieve the same effect. So I anticipate things being better for consumers in the not-too-distant future. But look at the conversation we're having here. And think of it in light of people saying, well, Amazon's a monopoly and needs to be broken up or whatever it is they do. We're not talking about Amazon jacking up prices. We're talking about Amazon (laughs) dropping its prices. (laughs) And they're going to put mom and pop stores out of business by charging us less. But if people really cared about that, they wouldn't buy things from Amazon. That's right. You say that about Walmart. Amazon has not closed a single business. The consumers have. No, that's right. By choosing not to buy. Yeah. Yeah, we've done all that. And honestly, there are certain things that I like having a point of sale in town. I like that I can go and talk to people. But boy, really, I want good prices. And it's no secret, Ant, that I am an aficionado of tobacco in all of its forms, except cigarettes, Mm -hmm. not those. Boy, I chew through a box of cigars every three or four days when I get going. 
The difference between walking into a brick and mortar store and buying online is probably somewhere near 100%. That's what the markups are like. Wow. I get these things for pennies on the dollar, comparatively speaking. I have never in my life bought a box of cigars from a tobacconist. I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. I'll go into the shop. I'll smoke one. I'll sit down. I'll relax. But I can't do the bulk of my shopping there. They're going to go out of business because they can't compete on price. They've got further expenses that they have to charge more. Their margins has to be higher than people who are just warehousing this stuff and packaging it up, sending it out. So this is in every market. You know, you want to be in the room with certain products and others. It just doesn't matter. Well, it's interesting you say that because I've developed this habit that when it comes to electronics, I'll go to the brick and mortar store to pick up the thing off the shelf and look at it and to read about it. And then I'll go home and buy it online where it's 20% cheaper. I've done that too. And especially, as you say, for electronics, for whatever the reason, I need to look at them in my hand before I know if I really want them. Mm -hmm. But Amazon has taken the sting out of this as well with the 30-day money-back, no-questions-asked policy that they have. Yep. Every now and then I buy something from Amazon. I look at it and I think, you got to be kidding me. And I wander into Kohl's, the department store right up the street. And I don't even have to have it in its original box. I just have to say, send this back to Amazon, will you? You just hand it to them and say, take it. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, you print out the email that you get when you initiate the return. But you don't have to have the original packaging and you don't have to have any packaging. And this is a company that I think has matured into understanding how to serve its clientele. I've had a couple of very unfortunate exchanges with people in China. Yeah, same here. And there's no recourse whatsoever. Yep. So now I don't buy things from China anymore. It's too risky. However, the Chinese sellers on Amazon, I'll buy from them all day long because I can return those things, right? And it turns out that a good return policy, it's like a proxy. You ask, what's the return policy? You hear 30 days, no questions asked. And you know in your heart, that's a company that wants to make you very happy. Mm -hmm. Other companies are hoping you come by once. And that's the problem I had with Chinese manufacturers. And see, this fits so beautifully when, again, going back to Amazon as a monopoly, I say to people, look, I don't worry that Amazon is the largest seller It got that way because consumers said, yes, I like their product. And the minute Amazon stops serving people the way you're describing, they're going to walk away. And that what we call monopoly status is not really a monopoly, but what we call monopoly status, consumers will rescind it. And that's what makes me not worry about Amazon. And I've seen cracks in Amazon's armor lately. It's just not as good, I think, as it was a year ago. They'll either address the things that are going wrong or they won't. Or something better will come along, right? That's right. If they don't, something better will come along. That's how Amazon was born in the first place. They were the thing that was better. Yep. So was Walmart. So was Sears once upon a time. And isn't it interesting? There's a human factor involved here, I think, that's important. You get some young, scrappy entrepreneurs together who have some fresh idea and they compete with the big company and they grow and they get more customers Then they become big. But then I think what happens is they ossify. Yeah, that's right. And I've been thinking about this for a while. I think what goes on is that the company gets big enough that its internal bureaucracy starts to exist for the purpose of the internal bureaucracy rather than for the purpose of the customer. That is exactly right. And the minute that happens, that company can no longer turn on a dime like the entrepreneur can. Not even close. Yeah. New entrepreneurs will come along and eat its lunch. I remember as a boy, my mother would drag me into this wretched place called Kmart. It was fondly known as came apart, given the high quality of the wares you could buy there. But they had this thing, the blue light special. The blue light special, yeah. This light on a pole that was rolled around the store and it would flash. Yeah, That's right. They had a blue light, like you'd see on top of an ambulance, right, on a wheeled cart, and they'd wheel it from one section to the other, and they'd make an announcement that the blue light special is now men's shoes, 20% off. And if you happen to be in the store when the blue light special hit, you get to brag to your friends or, you know, my mother bragged to her friends that she had made out like a bandit. What we found is that after the novelty of it wore off, it was still Kmart and crappy quality really wasn't going to work long term. It was enough to get people in, 
but it wasn't enough to keep competitors out. And before you know it, Kmart gave way to Walmart and Walmart was just so much better. And people are now rolling their eyes saying those Walmart store brands are not that great, but they're way better than anything you ever got from Kmart. Remember Walmart's, I don't know if it's still their tagline, but their tagline back in the day as they were competing against Kmart, their tagline was everyday low prices. Yeah. And that was in contrast to the blue light special. Yep. They're saying that everything in effect is a blue light special all the time. And on the grocery side, what did they do? They said, well, why would you need a card to get our best price? We don't have cards here. Just go buy what you want. Of course, Walmart took a bunch of body blows from Amazon. Walmart's not doing nearly as well as they could if there were no Amazon in our lives. Look at what Walmart did. It started to adopt some of Amazon's model. You could order online. It would go to this kiosk. You go and pick up whatever it is that you bought. They were working with their own goofy version of Prime, which right, wasn't right. really anything that was all that impressive. Matter of fact, I wonder if they still even do it. Yeah, I don't know. And notice that I'm not sure if they do it, which is probably a bad sign. I know exactly what Amazon is doing with Prime. Look, I buy stuff from Amazon. I never think about the shipping cost. Why? Because it's included in the price. What's happening here is that it's unclear what the right answer is. What is it that consumers want? Yeah. And so entrepreneurs, they try different things. You try the blue light special. You try the everyday low prices. You try the online, whatever it is. Entrepreneurs are throwing ideas in front of consumers, and consumers are going to pick. The thing that works, that will rise to the top, that will persist. The other things will fall by the wayside until somebody else comes along with a better idea. I kind of put my foot down around here. I didn't want Amazon Prime. I thought that it was frivolous. and You know, I resisted as well for a long time, yeah. And look, why would I pay for free shipping when I can get free shipping if I just charge $25 worth into the order? I would let things pile up. But it was when they went to video on demand. Yep, same thing here. I thought, well... Okay, sold. I did not want Prime, and now I can't live without Prime. Yep. Netflix seems not to be doing all that well lately. Their offerings are just somehow not as fresh as they once were. We're in a boutique situation. We can get our television content from any number of different places, and we all just go right out and do that. We pick the ones we want. We let the rest of them drop, and isn't that wonderful? And Netflix is a good example of what we were just talking about 20 years ago. It was the upstart. That's where you yeah. went because Blockbuster, which was the monopoly, you had to go to the Blockbuster store. People forget that Netflix mailed things to you. Yeah. And that was the cool thing. I don't have to go to a store. They could come up with innovative ideas quickly where Blockbuster had become kind of a dinosaur and slow to move. Now, Netflix is the one that's become a dinosaur and slow to move. And this is just the way these things go. Apparently, they spent far too much money on a couple of real losers as far as the TV shows that they sponsor. And I think there's a political undercurrent here where they got stuck, I think, with their pants down as they made some woke content hmm. that turns out the woke people are a very small portion of the audience. Who would have thought such a thing that the ones who jump up and down and yell the loudest might not actually be your audience anyway? But this has been demonstrated to them now, and what happens next is their business. Will I keep paying for it? Well, I don't know. I would like it to be something I want, but the day it ceases to be, I will cancel it. And this is why it's so important to keep government at arm's length. I mean, there are some things government should be doing when it comes to markets, but by and large, it should be kept at arm's length to give these entrepreneurs the maximum ability to come up with new ideas and present them to consumers. Yep. I give you, as a counterexample to this, the European Union just recently passed a law saying all electronic equipment have to come with USB-C connectors. And I can tell you, in my experience, USB-C is superior. But here's the problem. The European government has just locked them into that. And 20 years from now, they're still going to have USB-C while the rest of us have moved on to something better. Or they'll put one little tiny USB-C port in the back of the computer right, because that you the can't law even requires see. it, right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. People are going to wonder, why is that thing there? Yeah. And look, USB-C is superior. And yet it was a pain to switch over. And all these devices that operated on various kinds of USB ports, and now we've got another kind... And here we are, a year or two later, it's kind of shaken out, and most of the older things are becoming dinosaurs. So it's uncomfortable for a while, and Elizabeth Warren has the exact worst idea. 
let's force people to do this with technology. But this goes back to her statement, all these jobs that Joe Biden created is somehow in her mind. <laughs> and I would imagine other politicians' minds, they think that the stuff that's going on in the economy is due to them. That's crazy. And so naturally they start thinking, well, what should we do next? No, cut that out. None of this is due to you. <laughs> My personal favorite right now lists January 6th of all dates and then shows what gas cost then. Hmm. And down this list of things saying that, okay, all of this was great when Donald Trump was the chief cog. But now, ever since Joe Biden took over, all these increases in price are his fault. No. I even got a sticker that has Joe Biden pointing this way. Oh, I've seen it, right? I guess Joe did this. Yeah. Yeah, I got one. I don't know what to put that on because, <laughs> you know. I'm a reasonable human being. And if you want to point to something that Joe Biden has done, you might have a hard time finding anything that he's done. People are going to point to the whatever this last budget was of X trillion dollars deficit. And I would say, yeah, OK, he signed it in, in that sense. It's his budget. But I guarantee you, if Donald Trump had won the election instead of Joe Biden, plus or minus a few dollars, it would have been the same number that you're seeing now. Yeah. It's a function of what has built up over time. You and I started working together. I think it was in the George W. Bush administration. But we can go back to Clinton, maybe even to Bush Sr. And start pointing out that under each of these men, the country under the executive branch kind of got worse every year in terms of budgetary nonsense. You know, once in a while, it got a little bit better around the edges. But generally speaking, it was getting worse. And the trend gets worse every year, more or less. So when Trump is president and we say something crazy, like no matter who's president next, it's going to be this number or more. Yeah. I believe we said a trillion. Once the trillion was passed, once we got past that barrier, now it's always going to be in the trillions. I would imagine over the next decade, there might be a year, one year, where we drop down to 800 billion or 900 billion. But it's <laughs> going to be an aberration, and that's going to be it. That'll be the last time we ever see a number that small. So everybody who points at Joe Biden now and saying Trump was so much better, he was not. And whoever comes after Biden is not going to be better than Biden to any meaningful degree either. Yeah. This is a trend. We've been on this trend since 1958. Don't expect the trend to be reversed anytime yeah, soon. Yeah, it's not the function of the people. It's a function of the system and the incentives. On that happy note, I guess we're kind of done here. You got something else you want I to say? I don't. This has been a great conversation, James. From time to time, James and I do an episode, as we have done this time, in which we look at each other, it's time to record, and each of us says, well, what do you want to talk about? And the other one says, I have no idea. And we end up getting a pretty good episode out of it. <laughs> do you remember when you were young with your high school friends and you said, I don't know, what do you want to do? I don't know, what do you want to do? And you just do that all night sitting at your parents' basement. Well, one of two things happens. Either it ends up being a great night or you all end up in jail. <laughs> Some would claim that those two things are the same thing. Might not be mutually exclusive. <laughs> I had all kinds of great nights in which I ended up in a cell <laughs> later on. We'll talk about those later. <laughs> Bonus material. We'll go through my arrest record. That's right. If you want to hear about James' forays into jail, stop by Patreon. That's right. I often say I don't trust a man who's never spent a night in jail. <laughs> Anthony has never spent a night yeah, in jail. Yeah, I'm sorry, so being, James. I can't help you there. <laughs> it's being real quiet right now. That's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Join us next week when we probably have at least the semblance of a plan of some kind. Until then, follow us on Twitter. The stream of consciousness really does continue on the Twitters. Come on over and join us. And you could join our Facebook group, Words and Numbers Backstage, where the conversation continues. And you could also... You can send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. And I applaud those of you out there who are sending ever more ridiculous things to that account. Just keep it up, and sooner or later, Anthony will have to shut it down. But for now, it remains open. And I've been forgetting this a lot lately, which is probably because I've been so hostile in my heart, too. Let's all try, try to be nice to each other. It's hard for me, too. It's probably harder for me than it is for any of you. My nature is bombastic. You? <laughs> just shut the f*** up. Man. Just shut the f*** up. God. See, some one of these days, I'm going to be in the same room with you. I'm going to remember all this. Sh no, you won't. And I'm going to hit you so hard. Until then, have a good weekend. I'll catch you later. See you next week, James.